Yeah, this is this is all crazy. I mean, this is not what's going to happen, and and you know, the public is getting hoodwinked by people extremists. That's a good subtitle for the book. Maybe the public is getting hoodwinked. That's good. Well, that that could <laughs> a lot of books could go under that heading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not only is it an exciting time, but I think that many years from now, this era that we're living through right now will be seen as the golden era. This is Brain Inspired. Welcome. This is Paul Middlebrooks. All right. Well, I have now made it possible for you to support the podcast. Should you choose, I created a Patreon account, which you can access through the website, braininspired.co, or go directly to the Patreon page, and that's at patreon.com forward slash braininspired. And I got my first supporter, the man who actually strong-armed me into making this Patreon page, Alex. Thank you. So you can support the show at two levels for now, either $2 or $4 per month. That works out to $0.50 cents or $1 per episode. Uh, I don't have any gifts or special offers for you at this time, but uh, if you decide to support the show, I will be able to share things exclusively with you when they become available. Uh, maybe some toy code to play with, or if I write a book or want to release some bonus or special footage and material. Uh, whatever the case, people who support the show on Patreon will be the first to get that special stuff uh, for free or at a discount, etc. Plus, my wife will no longer be able to say, I bring home no bacon. Okay, uh, enough of that. The voice you heard at the beginning was indeed the Terence Sainovsky. Yes, that one. Uh, I was flattered such a legend would agree to come on the show, so... We all got lucky here. Terry has written a book called The Deep Learning Revolution. To say it's an insider's view uh, is a major understatement. So Terry was one of a handful of people who basically created AI as we know it today. Uh, since then, the man has never stopped putting out great work in both neuroscience and artificial intelligence. So we talk about his book, which I'm waiting for in my mailbox any day now. Uh, and our chat made me even more excited to get my hands on the book. We also talk about his online Coursera course with Barbara Oakley called Learning How to Learn, and it's the most popular online course ever. Okay, you'll hear I, I try to trip him up, and I, I ask him about his first published paper. This was in the world of astrophysics, his first love, uh, and it was published in 1969. Uh, and he immediately launches into a summary of the work like he had just released it yesterday. <laughs> it's amazing. So I had uh, so much left I didn't get to ask Terry because of time constraint. Really so much. So apologies for that, but I think you'll still enjoy and and get a lot out of our chat. Lastly, Terry was an early influence on me. <clears throat> like his book, The Computational Brain with Patricia Churchland, literally helped alter my life path. And I tell him as much right at the beginning. <laughs> and guess what I do? I flub the name of the book. So you'll get to hear that. Really ridiculous. I seriously considered editing that out and splicing in a correction, <laughs> but, but I decided to leave in the embarrassing moment. So I hope you enjoy hearing my heart jump out of my chest there in a few seconds. But uh, Terry was gracious and he let me live and we had a great conversation. A link to his book and all the other stuff that we talk about can be found in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 15. Please enjoy Terence Sainovsky. I have a distinct memory I'd like to share. So 20 years ago, uh, I was in an undergraduate at UT Austin, uh, University of Texas, and I was in aerospace engineering major. And that day I had gone to Half Price Books and picked up a couple books and, and gone to the laundromat. And this, I, I distinctly remember the, the low, the dim, yellowish lights of the laundry. And I read this book while my laundry was being done, and the book was called Computational Neuroscience by Patricia Churchland and Terence 
Sainovsky. Actually, actually, it was the computational brain, but thank you oh, anyway. Oh, the, the computational brain. Yeah, that's right. right. How can I mess that up? The computational brain. And uh, so that was 28 years ago. And it's actually recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. So uh, congratulations. So uh, that book, reading that book that day, actually changed the course of my path toward neuroscience. So uh, I just want to say thank you, Terry, and welcome to the podcast. Wonderful to be here. And also... Uh, thank you for uh, remembering the book because uh, 25 years is a long time. But it, in fact, uh, there's seeds of the current book that, uh, that is coming out next week is really contained in that first book. It was all about populations of neurons and how the early uh, work that was being done uh, by the neural network community with learning algorithms was giving us uh, the ability to create distributed representations in populations of neurons, very small at the time, like little toy problems. But it was already clear back then that this this was a kind of computing that the, the brain uh, it very much looked like the kind of computing the brain could be doing. Yeah, um, it, it was it was a great book and it really did change my, my path. So I don't really need to introduce you, um, but just by way of a, of a few tidbits here. So your thesis advisor was John Hopfield uh, of the famed Hopfield Network. Um, that helped usher in neural networks from the very beginning. And among a billion other things that you've done, you co-invented the, the Boltzmann machine with Jeff Hinton, which is one of the earliest actually useful neural networks. <laughs> and your early work helped drive the transition from the good old-fashioned type AI, the symbol-based AI, to the modern statistical data-driven approach that underlies all of the, um, the modern current successes of the deep learning networks. You've published over 500 papers and written 12 books, and now you're Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. So you've done so much, uh, and there are so many different directions that we could go. If, if you'll uh, allow me to, I'd like to start in 1969, though, uh, in the Astrophysical Journal with a paper titled uh, A Theoretical Analysis of Methods uh, of Interpreting Radio Line Data for H2 Regions. This was the first paper on your CV. Do you remember the gist of that paper and the conclusions drawn? Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> oh, th th this is the bringing back memories. This is uh, as I was uh, really uh, just getting started in science. Um, I had spent a, uh, a summer at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, working with an astrophysicist, uh, Robert Gelming, and uh, with the problem that we worked on was uh, uh, these are lines from H two regions. These are hot uh, uh, balls of of gas and uh, and there's something called the B sub n problem, which is uh, transitions between very high lying states of hydrogen, like between 109 and 110. Normally, we think of uh, the lines, you know, that you see in the visible coming from, uh, you know, the transitions from you know the the lower orbitals, but uh, when you're up there at 109, it's in the radio region, and and you can see them in in uh, radio telescopes. Hmm. So so that actually uh, was the beginning of my interest in astrophysics. And in fact, you mentioned that John was my PhD advisor at Princeton, uh, but in fact, my master's degree was with John Wheeler, mm -hmm. who uh, black hole fame and general relativity, and and that's really uh, when I first went to Princeton. Uh, you know, this is before any, any uh, neural networks or the brain or anything. Right. It really was to, uh, con it was go my path was set. I was going to work with John Wheeler. And, you know, of course, uh, no one can predict where uh, one's career is going, but uh, here I am. Yeah, right, right. Well, I didn't, I didn't predict uh, 20 years ago when I was reading uh, your book that I'd be interviewing you on a podcast, you know, or that podcast would exist. So <laughs> this is nice for me. <laughs> right. Okay, so I want to get to your new book in, in just a second that's coming out. Um, first, I just want to talk briefly about your online course and, and the book, Learning How to Learn. So this is a Coursera course, uh, the full title of which is Learning How to Learn, Powerful Mental Tools to Help You Master Tough Subjects. Um, and you do the course with Barbara Oakley, and it's now the most popular uh, massive online open course to date, um, which is awesome. I took it. It's great. Uh, and it's accessible for everyone. And really what it does, it, it talks about the neuroscience uh, about uh, behind how we learn and how to use what we know about neuroscience to learn more effectively. Where did the idea come from to, to make this course? And, and how did you connect with Barbara Oakley to do it? Well, that's a, a really uh, a wonderful story. Um, 
the the background is that I've been a co-director for uh, 10 years of a, a science of learning center sponsored by the NSF at UCSD, my sister institution. I'm, uh, my lab's at the Salk, but I'm actually on the faculty also at uh, the University of California in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the, the science of learning center is to try to bring, you know, our understanding of, you know, how uh, the brain develops, uh, you know, how language emerges, and, and there are six centers, each looking at a different aspect of education and the brain. And ours was the one that really focused more on uh, learning mechanisms. Uh, you know, what, what do we know about uh, how the hippocampus mm -hmm. is uh, engaged when we're learning something, a new fact about the world? And the other thing that we tried to do was to uh, interface with schools. So we uh, worked very closely with the, the Price School on campus as a charter school. And um, our experience was that we were very excited about the science. We wanted to bring them into the classroom, but it turned out to be incredibly difficult, even you know, with a school on campus. And the reason is that there's a tremendous amount of barriers that if, if you try to go into a school, you have to get permissions from all sorts of people. Fortunately, you know, the principal, uh, Doris Alvarez of the Price School was very open. But if you go to a, a high school, you know, in the inner city, forget it. Uh, you know, they, 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 for them, it's just another complication. Hmm. But what's worse, uh, if you have the best solution to education, there are 12,000 school districts in the U.S. So you'd have to knock on 12,000 doors. So immediately you realize it doesn't scale. Uh, what we're trying to do doesn't scale. You know, it might work in one classroom, but how do you go from that to, you know, hundreds of thousands of classrooms? So he, uh, here I was, um, uh, and this is completely fortuitous. I was at a meeting that was taking place at the uh, UC, UC Irvine up the road, mm -hmm. and it was sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences. It's a National Academy uh, Keck uh, Futures Initiative, NACFI, that I actually helped to organize. And one of the speakers uh, that I introduced was Barbara. And, and she was telling us the story of her life. It's fascinating. She's, she's a, a remarkable woman. As she put it, she you know, was flunked her way through math in high school. She, she really wasn't very good at it. Th this is and, chronicled and, in her book, Mind Shift, as well, right? That's right. Yep. And, 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 and that's right. So there's another book and another MOOC that came uh, afterwards. And, mm. and, and, and that's uh, a follow-up. But uh, what, I, what I came away understanding from her presentation is that after going off and learning Russian and having adventures, you know, in the Arctic uh, fishing uh, tr trawlers and in the army, she really wanted to try to master math. And she, she figured out how to do it, I mean, on her own. And uh, she went back, not just master of math, but got a PhD in electrical engineering and is now a professor of electrical engineering at uh, Oakland University in Michigan. So, you know, what a career trajectory. Wow. Talk about, you know, being able to you know, confront uh, something that had been bothering her, f you know, for her whole life and actually making a career out of it. So in any case, I was so impressed. I had dinner with her and we all, uh, hit it off. I invited her to come give a talk at our a Science of Learning Center, which she did. She came and, and flew in and, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to invite not just the faculty, but uh, high school teachers and students. And so we had a big auditorium filled with, you know, people of all ages and backgrounds. And she was mesmerizing, unbelievable. She had, it was clear that she, you know, had this talent for engaging the audience. And, and she did things that I, I would have never even thought of doing. For example, to reach the high school students, she used metaphors like uh, zombies, and it turns out I didn't notice that zombies are really big in high school these days. And she said, you know, if you are having trouble with trying to understand something, uh, you're, you're you have this mental block. Don't beat your head against the wall over and over again. Don't be a zombie. Uh -huh. That's what zombies do. Get up, walk around, do something else. Just free your mind up, and your subconscious is going to work on it, and you come back to it a half hour later, and it'll be much clearer. In any case, what became clear to me was that uh, this is, you know, she was uh, intuitive in terms of her understanding of the learning process. She was very good at communicating. And what really what was missing 
was a scientific understanding of the mechanisms underlying her experiences and her the practical advice that she was giving to the students. It was all good, but she didn't really couldn't explain to them why it, why it was good. I and see. so you know over the period of the next uh, six months or so, we put together this MOOC. And now here's here's another remarkable thing about Barbara. Um, if you go online, there are like 10,000 MOOCs now, and, and the typical MOOC is a talking head. And this is a professor who has been giving the same course for the last 10 years, right. and they're an automatic pilot, and they're just basically parroting, and it could be a very good lecture, and there's nothing wrong with the material or anything. It's just that it really is is soporific. I mean, it kind of, it, it doesn't grab your attention in, in fact, uh, much less so than if it was a classroom, because in the classroom, at least, the person is walking around and they have the opportunity to interact with the audience and with the with the students in the classroom. But if you're doing a MOOC, it's like talking into a vacuum. You don't have any feedback. It's very difficult. It's actually much more difficult than giving a classroom lecture. In in, in my experience, for example, uh, I was, so I was I was giving uh, a taping one of my MOOCs, and I launched with this joke. That I thought w would be, uh, you know, in a regular lecture, get some reaction. Yeah, yeah. Get silence. Yeah. And you have no idea how frightening that is because you have no idea did they get the joke? Uh, should I go on in the same direction? <laughs> you know, what's what's going on here? So that that's the problem. Okay. So here's what Barbara did, which is really remarkable. She realized that if you and we were aiming at high school students, by the way. Uh, if who are the people who are really in the business of learning, right? That's that's their that's the they go to work every day to learn. She realized that we needed to engage them using all the tools that are available for uh, animating, the, you know, the yeah. uh, concepts, the metaphors. And she did something which really was brilliant. It's called green screen, and it's what uh, weathermen use right when they're pointing to the, you know, the the uh, hurricane in Florida. Mm -hmm. There's actually a green screen behind them, and, and it's being projected electronically to the audience, and and that means you can put anything up. You can add, you can put animations up. You can put uh, you know pictures, movies, anything you want. And and so that's what she did. She did it in her basement. Oh wow! Her husband was her uh, film editor. You know, they, so they, they she she bought a camera, high res camera. She 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 bought a, uh, a software to do some uh, video editing. And she really, she was the one who did all of the uh, the cuts and the animations and everything that uh, that you saw on that MOOC, Learning How to Learn, yeah. was done in her basement for $6,000. Oh, I had no idea. And so what she realized, again, intuitively, is that motion really captures your attention. We injected humor, and, and that is incredibly important for emotional engagement, right? You need to get people to laugh you need to get people to be interested in terms of their uh you know what they're with their not just what they're thinking but what they're feeling she was a master at that and and i think that those are the, all the reasons we don't know for sure but you know it it, it, it i think it really helped to uh help to get a, a, an audience that not only i think uh, benefited but actually was a super enthusiastic we we have i get fan mail every day but you, you said that you guys created the course uh, aimed at sort of teens, but that but your the majority of your audience has been professional adults, correct? That's the shock, okay? And I, this is true not just of our MOOC. It turns out to be all MOOCs. We, of the 3 million learners, only 1% uh, were f from that target audience below 19. Yeah. The biggest demographic was 25 to 35. Mm-hmm. And half of them are college educated. So we're talking about a group that, is in the workforce. They've left school. Uh, they probably have families and mortgages, and but they're discovering that they need new skills in order to be able to do their job, because you know the day you graduate, basically what you've learned is obsolete. Because you know the you know what's going on right now is moving so quickly that the schools just can't keep up with it. Mm -hmm. And but the the beauty of the MOOC is that it allows you to do that on your own time. You don't have to go back to school. You don't have to interrupt your life. You can take whatever course you need for whatever skill you need. So it's it's a perfect thing. So the MOOCs really aren't a replacement for schools. They're basically, I think, are going to evolve into a lifelong learning delivery system so that you know people can continue to learn for their entire life as they need new skills. 
So that that's right. So that, so uh, we so we failed uh, to reach <laughs> we to reach the audience we were aiming at. And then you know, it, someone pointed out the obvious to us. Look, these poor students are they spent all day in classrooms learning. And what you want them to do is to take another course. Right. That's the right. last thing they want to do. You know, at night, come on, you know. I mean, these schools, they're doing homework. Uh, they've got a life, you know. And so so we realized that this was the wrong way to go about it. And so we, we actually created a whole new MOOC uh, that is, um, is in it, conjunction with the University of Arizona that's going to go online very soon. Is it zombie-free? It is. No, the, the, <laughs> there are zombies, but it's filled with metaphors. Oh, okay. Maybe, we really it, we made a huge effort to really create a um, a metaphorical world that they, they could understand things on their own terms, and we actually wrote a, a book that just came out in August, uh, learning how to learn, mm -hmm. you know, for kids, and uh, it's already a bestseller on Amazon, and and it's aimed at uh, it is aimed at the high school 12 to 14, by the way, middle school. That's the key age at which a lot of students are turned away by math because they, they hit algebra, basically. So we really wanted to help those students, and we're going to do it through the teachers. So the idea is that the teachers have this text that the students can read because it's written for them. And we, by the way, we, we uh, added another author who is a, a child book, a, a writer for, for children's books, which is a special talent I don't have. Which, which, you know, what words you're going to use and how you uh, pitch things. And we have we have a, a, a very, very uh, talented artist who drew uh, cartoons for us to make it, you know, come make it come alive. So this this book is, is I think, uh, are, are going to be, I hope, our entrance to that age group. Great. Well, so aside from all the techniques that you guys have, uh, uh, you know, developed and, and communicate in the course, what is your secret to accomplishing so much? I mean, do you have like a favorite productivity tool or strategy that you'd recommend to people? Well, it helps to have a, uh, I have a big lab. Yeah. And I have a fantastic lab manager. And I really depend a lot. Uh, I, I expect a lot from people in my lab and they, they are tremendously supportive of me. Right. Mm. You, you can't do it all that on your own. I, I could never have done this MOOC without Barbara. Right, right. right. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm also the president of the NIPS Foundation, Neural Information Processing Systems. Yeah. Last year in Long Beach, we had 8,000 people. You know, I, I couldn't have run that meeting on my own, but uh, <laughs> my, Mary Ellen Perry, my lab manager, who is, is, is very capable and, and, and really works very closely – uh, with me and with the, the, the sponsors and, and the academics and, the, you know, we, we really have a team. That's the secret is to have a really first rate team for every project. And it's not just practical projects, but it's also for scientific projects. And so we, a lot of the research that we do in the lab is really working with uh, people from different backgrounds. And that's important too, by the way. You know, we're in, everyone lives in a silo. If you're in a physicist in a physics department, you're in a silo. Right. But you know, where, where the, the excitement is these days isn't in the silos. Although you know, some nice things are happening in physics. There's no doubt. But if you really want to have a uh, breakthrough sort of uh, advances, then you need to bring together people who have different backgrounds. You know, people from uh, mathematics, cognitive science bioengineering, uh, neuroscience, and, the, and my, my, you know, the graduate students and postdocs, I come from all those backgrounds, so it's fantastic. It's like having a little university, and we discuss things, and every, everybody has a different perspective, and, and that's how you make the breakthroughs, is that you, you get that, that synergy between the different uh, people w w that have very different backgrounds. Radical collaboration. That's good. Okay, so... Your book, your new book, which it's been a long time since you've written a book uh, by yourself, speaking of <laughs> getting things right. done. And so so this the book's called The Deep Learning Revolution. Actually, by the time this podcast airs, it, I should have gotten my copy because I had pre-ordered it on Amazon. And I think wow. I, I think the 23rd of October is when it's supposed to ship. That is the date. And uh, it's actually in the warehouse already. So I have an advanced copy. So I've, 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 it's a beautiful book. I mean, you'll, you'll be pleased. I, I was incredibly uh, hmm. 
just proud to, to hold it. I mean, it was it's just such a beautiful object, full color. Oh, yeah. And, and it really, uh, the paper is really, uh, it has a good feel to it. The, the art, you know, they did a great design job. MIT Press is fantastic. Mm. I have worked with them for, you know, over 30 years, and I've always been um, happy with the, with the product. They're very, very good. But the book itself was a reaction starting you know, a couple of years ago when, as you know, this uh, deep learning hit the, the uh, public press. Yeah. And I said, wait a second now, this is just renaming something that I've been doing since the 1980s, right? Right. The, these learning algorithms, all the learning algorithms that are being used today were first pioneered by, uh, you mentioned the Bolsonaro machine, Jeff Hinton and I worked on that back in the 1983, right? And back propagation came a few years after that. So this is basically taking what we had done back then and just scaling it up. Yep. You know, yep. creating more units. We, you know, we, we, we went uh, back then, we had tiny networks with a few hundred units, a few thousand connections, one layer of hidden units. And now we have millions of units you know, hundreds of millions of connections. In the brain, there was 12 layers in the hierarchy in the visual system, but now people have 100 layers in some of <laughs> yeah. the speech recognition networks. I mean, this is this is really amping up what we had done by you know, a million times. So I thought that, gee, you know, they don't seem to understand the history here. They think that it was all created, you know, full-blown five years ago uh, at a NIPS meeting. And so, I th so that was my part of my motivation. But the real motivation was I started reading articles in the newspaper about how, oh my God, this is this AI is going to ha put people out of work. Yeah. Oh, it's it, it's going to replace humans. You know, we're going to become obsolete. Yeah, this is this is all crazy. I mean, this is not what's going to happen, and and you know, the public is getting hoodwinked by people extremists. That's a good subtitle for the book. Maybe the public is getting hoodwinked. That's good. Well, that that could. <laughs> A lot of books could go under that heading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but this 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 is another thing. I said, well, look, they they really they should have access to something that is more sensible. By the way, there is the other extreme, which is um, the people who said, oh, this is utopia. You know, we're going to be able to uh, solve all the problems, and you know, humans are going to have this incredible uh, new life that they won't have to do any hard work, and they'll, everything will be beautiful, and the mm -hmm. medical diagnosis will happen automatically, and blah blah. You know, those are the two extremes that p people seem to gravitate t toward, and neither of them is the reality. So here, here's an example of why that is and, is, and the reason is that humans just cannot imagine the impact that a new technology will have. And I'll give you an example. So back in the 1990s, when the internet went from a way for academics to exchange uh, information, which was, you know, it used to be called ARPANET back when I was at my first job at, at Johns Hopkins. But when it went commercial, suddenly, you know, you had web browsers, uh, companies went online, started selling things. You know, Amazon, you know, was uh, just a, a fledgling back then. Could anybody have imagined the impact that the Internet was going to have on everybody's life today, you know, 30 years later? And the, the reality is nobody could. You know, it's, it's affected everything, every aspect of life. You know, the, it's you know, music, uh, commerce, taxis. You know, social media, politics, it's astonishing how uh, and nobody, you know, in no science fiction writer, I think, was imaginative enough to figure this out. So I think that we're in a similar position here. OK, this is we have a mechanism now that can amplify human cognition in the same way back 250 years ago in the Industrial Revolution. We created machines that can amplify physical power so that, you know, one, you know, with with a tractor, one human can plow a hundred times more fields than a single human with a horse, right? Yeah. Now it's going to be the case that a, hu a single human is going to have much more uh, impact uh, through uh, these co I call them cognitive appliances, right? This is not a robot that's going to go around, you know, uh, replacing you. This is basically <laughs> a way to amplify you, what you can do, and. And how smart you can be. So I, the mantra in the book is AI will make you smarter. 
Ah, very good. So you're obviously passionate about it. You can kind of, um, I, I skimmed like the table of contents and you can read some of the stuff when you look at the book uh, online. And I came across that you had written the first draft of it within just a couple weeks. Is that right? Well, you know, this, this was a, uh, a epiphany I had. Uh, I, I like to go hiking every year with friends to different parts of the world. And I just came back from Norway in, in uh, end of September, which was a fantastic uh, Lofoten, hmm. which are islands off the uh, northwest coast of Norway, just fjords coming up from the ocean. It's just spectacular. But I, I was hiking uh, again in the fall in the Pacific Northwest in the Olympics. And, you know, a couple of weeks clears your mind. And you, you really uh, begin to sort of uh, feel, a bro you start thinking about the past, mm. and you start thinking about the future. And I suddenly, I realized that, gee, you know, I have a story to tell. And I started, you know, just in my mind, you know, putting together the, some chapters. And I said, hey, this could be fun. And so when I got back, you know, I had a lot of energy because after a couple of weeks of hiking, you're in good physical shape and you, your mind is clear. So I just said, I'm just going to sit down and I'm just going to start writing. And and I it, literally in two weeks, I had a first draft. But wow. now it, it's a completely different book from the one that I have now. But but it, it, already I could see how, how it was going to play out. It was going to have three parts. The first part was about the past. You know, this, this is a uh, artificial intelligent past yep in the middle is going to be artificial intelligence today and the third part is going to be artificial intelligence in the future right C kind of you know this is uh, the christmas story but yeah, <laughs> yeah. For artificial intelligence and uh, it's also the classic three three act play you know three act and structure. that's the three act play. there you go exactly right in, in fact as i started writing it i, I found a voice which was very comfortable for me, which was basically, it's as if I was a, it was a personal narrative. It mm. was, I'm, I'm there. I mean, I, I try to write it in such a way that a reader could put themselves there at that, in the 1980s. What was it like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was going on in the world? And, you know, who was getting, who was getting all of the publicity or who was, who was, who, who was, uh, working together and how do they how do they interact and these are all my friends right so i i read about it the way i i saw it and i think that that really put a, a different character it's not a book that's meant for the experts it's 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 a book that's meant for a general audience i think experts can get a lot out of it too because of the fact that there's a lot of technical stuff in it but i don't that's not the the heart of it the heart of it is a personal story mm -hmm. and it's also it's about science how do you how is how does science engineering how is it done and you know it, it to the public you know they have this the, what's the image of science well there's a mad scientist right there's some g genius you know the einstein I mean, it, it's all distorted I mean, those are extreme uh, metaphors for what's really going on you know science is put together by humans just like everybody and you know we we have uh brilliant scientists and we have plotters and we have people who are really good at writing textbooks and so it, it's the whole range you need them all but the creative part of science is ultimately it's a group activity it's not like you have one genius who who creates it and everybody follows it right that's not my experience and i, I think that is very rare occasionally it might happen like with einstein but i, th I think that the traditional scientific enterprise is won by human beings with the same strengths and weaknesses of all human beings everywhere. And, but somehow we manage to come together in teams, and this is the key. It's a social enterprise. What we're doing is, is a, uh, through interactions with each other, sharing ideas, helping each other, that's how things breakthroughs are made. And, and that's what happened back in the 80s. Yeah, I was surprised, actually. I was uh, recently reading Stephen Johnson's book, uh, Where Good Ideas Come From. And he talked about some studies that were done in labs about how innovations take place. And the highest rate of innovation essentially took place during lab meetings, where everyone's sharing ideas across the table, which was a little surprising to me. 
It, well, isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, that's my experience, too. I had no idea that, that he wrote about it. And why is that? Well, here's the reason. Uh, I, you know, my, my perspective is that it's like you're having a dialogue with a, a single collective of minds that are all focusing on a problem and, and they have to actually, this is the other thing, it, 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 this comes across, there was another study that was done on creativity in uh, industry. And in order for this to happen, this kind of groupthink, there has to be trust. Mm. In other words, some, someone has to be willing to, to say what they think, even though it may sound crazy or they can't be afraid that they're going to, people are going to laugh at them. Right. When you, when you come up with a new idea, it's right. always the case that it's, it's not what anybody <laughs> else thought of. So therefore, uh, people are likely to, you know, you might, you know, for, who don't know you might laugh at it or, you know, it's, it's poo poo it because, you know, a lot of it's hard to be open like that. And so I think that the, the idea of a lab meeting is that you have a, a lab that is working together and they trust each other. And if they don't, then you don't have a good lab. Yeah. Good. So I, I've um, watched you on a talk. You've expressed uh, how great it is right now that we have two things simultaneously going on. We have uh, the massive success in, in deep networks, in AI, and we have these new powerful tools being developed in neuroscience. In, in your estimation, is this the most exciting time to uh, be studying how brains work? Not only is it an exciting time, but I think that many years from now, this era that we're living through right now will be seen as the golden era. Mm -hmm. The golden era when we, for the first time, had the tools that we needed to make progress. And, you know, I'm not sure how, how uh, we still haven't scratched the surface of the, the com complexity of the brain. Right, but I think, right. though, that we're, we have, at least we, we now have enough tools. And by the tools, I mean not just uh, le electrodes and optical recording, but uh, analytical algorithms that allow us to analyze the big data that's being generated. Now, here, here's something that is a little of, a, of an interesting uh, feedback loop here. So, you know, NIPS, Neural Information Processing System, was really uh, born out of the neural network uh, explosion that took place in the 80s, and I've already alluded to the learning algorithms that we developed back then. Yeah. And we didn't know it, but what we were really doing was creating a whole new field of machine learning. That is to say, in statistics at the time, the way that you made progress was by working with very tiny models with a few parameters and proving theorems about when it converged, you know, some uh, system for fitting the data. Well, we, we were, we're, you know, here we are naive, you know, we're talking about, you know, let's try to understand how the brain with 100 billion neurons, right? <laughs> Talk about, you know, and 10 to the 15 parameters, right? How are you going to uh, deal with that uh, amount of complexity? It's, it's only 84 billion neurons. Come on. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I think when I say 100, I mean, you know, plus or minus, yeah. uh, you know, 20 yeah. <laughs> percent. Nobody has actually counted every neuron. And, and actually, I get into arguments with my students about this. And it, it, actually, the number varies with the size of your brain. So some people have bigger brains, some people have a smaller brain. So, you know, this is this is not a single number. But in any case, uh, here we are. And so who came to NIPS? And this is this is really fascinating. Those first few years. We only had, you know, three, four hundred people show up, but they were people coming from areas that, you know, had never interacted before. I mean, we're talking about, you know, physicists, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, uh, mathematicians, computer vision people, speech recognition people, natural language people. And what was common to all of them was that they were trying to tackle really difficult problems, very high dimensional problems. And they weren't making much progress with the traditional tools that mm. were available to them uh, in statistics. You know, I, rem I remember in that era, we basically, you know, the experts kept telling us that we we're wasting our time. Why? Well, number one, we don't have enough data. If you want to develop a, a statistical analysis, a tool that is going to learn from data, then, you know, you only have 100 images, right? So how, how are you going to constrain, you know, you're overfit? With, with your network that has, you know, 100,000 connections parameters. And then the, the optimization experts, you know, what they told us was that, oh, forget it. If you're crazy, you're going to get caught in local minima. 
everybody knows that you have to have convex optimization function, and otherwise, you know, you're, you're toast. Well, you know, we were naive, we are young, we went ahead anyway, and we just ran it, and it worked. You know, we didn't understand why it worked. We now know now that the reason is that when you're dealing with these high-dimensional spaces, it looks very different than a 1 or 2 or 3D space mm. where you have mountain valleys and, and, and local minima. If you're in a million-dimensional space, they're all saddles. You know, you, you have a half a million going up, and you have a half yeah. a million going down, so you always have an escape route. Mm. Right, and 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 so no one understood this at back then because no one had really tackled high dimensional problems before. And interestingly, a couple of people from statistics did. Leo Bryman was one of, on our board of trustees very early on, and he 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 was uh, you know an expert on 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 trying to tackle these problems, but he was in the minority back then. Hmm. And I and I really appreciated him very much because he he gave us you know a real. Um, perspective that you know what we're trying to do wasn't completely crazy you know? <laughs> and he felt it's really interesting he told me he felt more affinity with the nips group than with his own affinity group in statistics you know he, he really understood what we're trying to do and but you know back then we just couldn't scale it up computers were really slow by today's standards and so the real discovery that was made five years ago and this is something nobody i think could have predicted 30 years ago is that of all the algorithms in AI, this is the only one that has scaled. That's say by a factor of a million. Yeah. You know, typical uh, AI algorithm is combinatoric, which means that it blows up exponentially at some point, and and means you have a, a ceiling. But th if you have an algorithm like backprop, which is linear in, in the parameters, basically it just scales beautifully, and 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 you know, the more and it's all parallelized, so it goes beautifully on a GPUs, and and on, here, here's the the real reason. Okay, the scaling and uh, because of the fact that this the architecture, once you've tuned it up and once you have uh, optimized it, which is what Jan LeCun did with convolutional neural networks over the period of you know 20 years, yeah, the very same architecture can be applied to many problems. Right. You don't have to be a domain expert, and so that means that if you have something that works for speech, you know you could you, you know you have to adapt it, but it, it can be used for uh, natural language processing. It could be used for uh, object recognition images, captioning images. All these difficult problems in AI could be attacked if you have enough data. And that we're living in an era of big data, and that's really where I think everything comes together. And that that's why it kind of was a convergence. And now to go back to your other comment, okay, uh, just to finish uh, the come to loop back. Isn't it ironic today that neuroscientists are now using the machine learning algorithms that we developed yeah. in NIPS over the last 30 years? And not just deep learning, by the way. They're using it now, a few labs. But, you know, the support vector machines, which is really hot in the 90s, uh, is now being used routinely by <laughs> yeah. brain imaging people, right? I mean, that's yeah. how they, they, they decode their brain data. And, and so it, it, all of these algorithms that were developed in the machine learning community are now helping neuroscientists understand the brain that were originally inspired by the brain. So this is kind of a really, I, you know, it's, I, I kind of find it really... Uh, you're back. You're back as well. Sorry. I think we had a dropout. Yeah, we did. Uh, sorry, we got cut off there. But so I was going to say that, yeah, we were talking about the this loop, the, the irony of the beautiful loop of, uh, you know, the, the machine learning tools being used in neuroscience now. So, I mean, deep learning has had huge successes um, and, and in all these different fields, like you say, but lately it's gotten uh, kind of some backlash, some criticism, because it's uh, seemed to be such a small part of what we will eventually need to achieve general AI. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on general AI and getting there and the role of deep learning in that. Right. So l let's put things in perspective. And I have a chapter on this, by the way. Oh, good. Uh, if you take the biggest deep learning network today, it would fit into a cubic millimeter of cortex, okay? So, and, and each deep learning network is a domain expert in, in one problem. So it's very narrow, it's called narrow AI. But the, the beauty is though that in the brain, which has, you know, hundreds of thousands of such deep learning networks in it, you have to create a system. It's another higher level of organization, which, which is, uh, in the computer is called an operating system, right? The operating system has to keep track of all the subroutines that are going on, demons and scheduling, and, and you know, it, it's an interface between the applications and the hardware. 
and, and it's invisible. And what we don't know yet is what is the operating system of the brain? And ultimately, if you want human level intelligence, you're going to have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, what I think what will, it will evolve in the world of AI is that all of these you know, successes, which are very narrow, are, are going to eventually have to be integrated together into a broader uh, system that is able to handle rooting of information, decision making. And, and that's beginning to happen, by the way. So, for example... Uh, in AlphaGo, in addition to deep learning networks, there was also a basal ganglia, that is to say, a reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, temporal differences, mm -hmm. which which was a loop with the cortex. And that's an algorithm that also goes back to the 80s, Rich Sutton, right? But we now know that uh, in the dopamine neurons in, in um, vertebrate brains, and also neurons even in insect brains, you know, that do c conditioning, you know, running on dopamine are doing reward prediction error, which is the, the key to understanding how to develop a value function that allows you to make decisions, a sequence of decisions to reach a reward, to reach your goal. And so what I think is going to happen over the course of the next few decades is as we learn more about the brain and more learning algorithms that nature has developed, they're going to be in integrated into an AI system that will become more and more autonomous and have higher capabilities. And eventually, you know, we might reach human level intelligence, but I don't think that's really necessarily the, the ultimate goal. Right. I think the ultimate goal is to understand the human brain. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I think AI is going to help us do that. That's the beauty. And why do I say that? Here's, I think, where NIPS is going and it's where everybody's going. Everybody says, well, look, it's like a black box. You know, you have something that solves a problem, but you don't know how it solved it and how can you trust it if you can't solve it? Well, my re immediate response is, you know, you have a brain. You use it. Do you understand how it works? No. You know, but you trust it right. uh, within limits. And so uh, that's where we are. OK. However, we can go much farther because it turns out these deep learning networks are not black boxes. They're white boxes. They're completely accessible. We have access to every connection, every parameter, every input, every activity pattern of every input. Right. If we can't understand mathematically from a, a, a engineering and, and a analytical perspective, how these devices work, then you know, we would never understand the brain. <laughs> and so what's happening now at NIPS is that we're getting the best mathematicians coming in using algebraic topology to understand the, 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 the surfaces of the cost function. Uh, there are these adversarial examples that show that by just tweaking a couple of inputs, you know, by putting in small changes, you can hit a boundary. Wow, what's that telling us about the geometry? We're, now we're in this high-dimensional space. We're learning... This is a completely new world now that mathematicians have jumped into, and I think what will come out at the end is a theory of learning hmm. in these very high-dimensional systems, which of which the brain is one of, of, of many, many systems that we've, we know there are many learning algorithms that take you to the same place, so why not the brain? And that will give us a theory for learning in the brain. Well, wow, that's great. Well, I know that I'm stretching your time thin here, and um, I just want to say thanks for your contributions and... Uh, I appreciate your time today. Uh, good luck and congratulations on the book. I'm uh, excited to get my copy. I have one final question. If you had to be cryogenically frozen today, uh -huh. and the minimum answer here is one day, when would you want to be thawed? Okay. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Let me think about it. But I, I have to say that here's, here's a, 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 a heuristic that I've used, which is, Take the minimum amount of time that you would do it, and I say the minimum would be ten years. Oh, okay. And take and take the maximum that you would be willing to live with, and let, let's say that's a uh, hundred years. So take the geometric mean, and that's a, a square root of a thousand. So we're talking about like thirty-three years. So that's my answer: thirty-three and a third years. All right, Sinovsky's, uh heuristic. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It was a lot of fun, and I appreciate uh, your uh, letting me have this opportunity to uh, be part of your podcast. Okay, awesome stuff. Remember, if you want to support the show, find my Patreon link. Uh, on the website, braininspired.co. You can find me on Twitter as well. I am at PGMid. Next week, I'm talking with Ryota Kanai, who is working on creating artificial consciousness. 
So no doubt that will be a fun conversation. Until then, thanks for listening and thank you for your support. See you next time.